Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for staying for the last, very, very last session. Uh, so you must be load balancing enthusiasts. Uh, welcome to the deep dive into elastic load balancing using the Octavia Active Active Topology. My name is Dean. I'm from IBM Research in Haifa, Israel. And with me here is Alan from our cloud dev team in Northern San Jose. Now I'm going to, since this was advertised as a beginner session, I'm just making sure that everybody knows the terminology. Um, people listening a few sessions ago to the heat and Elbas, probably that, that, that should have been a prerequisite to our talk. But so uh, essentially load balancing just to motivation and terminology. Uh, we have, uh, I assume I have a service on the cloud and I'm using uh, horizontal scaling to provide that service with a pool of backend servers. Uh, and that pool of backend servers, the members of that, the, the, uh, each backend server is called a member. The entire thing is called a pool. Uh, that provides high availability. Uh, so essentially, if one server fails, we don't have a service failure. And it provides performance. Uh, so the load is shared between all these backend servers. Uh, of course, the performance is elastic, so I can have a large pool if I have a lot of, uh, if my service is very successful and if my service is not so successful, I have a few members in my pool. And that's sort of essential. Uh, from the user's perspective, they use a service IP or a VIP. Uh, they don't know which backend server actually answers and serves their content. And for that, of course, we need a component that does splits the traffic across all these backend servers, and that component is the load balancer. So load balancer does distribution of every new connection over this backend service. Uh, it avoids failed servers, so it doesn't forward to any server that failed. It avoids overloaded servers and distributes the load among those servers. So it provides a performance. It's important to note that the load balancing, the load balancing as a service, is not the pool manager. Okay, so it's completely independent. You do need a pool manager to manage your pool, heat, Senlin, or whatever, or what have you. Uh, this is actually going to add and remove your uh, m members. Uh, the load balancer will use whatever uh, backend service you have and will report broken ones since it's uh, aware of which uh, servers fail. So for that, it has a health monitor and it has a stat collector so it can perform all this availability and uh, performance uh, optimization. Uh, the last piece of terminology is the uh, LB algorithm. Okay, so we need to load balance something. Uh, number of connections, CPU. Uh, our, the current Octavia load balancing supports uh, things, uh, least number of connection, uh, source IP, round robbing. Uh, these are the types of algorithms that are supported right now. And another important uh, term is affinity. Affinity means that uh, packets that are similar to each other go to the same backend server. So obviously we want all packets from the same TCP flow to go to the same backend server. But usually we want more than that for performance purposes. Uh, for instance, if we do SSL termination, we would like all packets from the same source IP to go to the same backend to have uh, abbreviated handshakes for the TLS and improve performance. Uh, of course, we will want the same HTTP sessions or same users to go to the same backend service, et cetera. Now we come to the uh, load balancing as a service. Okay? So OpenStack has load balancing as a service. It has two versions of the load balancing API. Uh, I'm focused here on load balancing as a service version two because version one doesn't exist for me. Uh, and so the load balancing uh, API defines these logical components. Uh, we have our load balancer, which is equivalent in, 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 in a sense to the VIP. We have listeners, so we can have multiple protocols. We can have uh, one listener listening on port 80 for HTTP traffic, another listening on another port for HTTPS traffic, and so on. And we have pools of members that actually implement the back end. Uh, we have policies associated with the listeners deciding which pool to go to as a default pool, or we can have uh, layer seven uh, policies to distribute to more pools. And these pools can actually be shared between listeners. Uh, and also we can have different load balancing algorithms for each pool. Uh, for each pool also we have uh, health monitoring uh, to check, so we can have different health monitoring. Of course, it depends on the protocol. Uh, so uh, the current API uses the LBAS uh, prefix, 
and that's the name of, just the name of the logical component on the, your regular create, delete list, show, and so on. Octavia is not a load balancer. Octavia is a load balancing as a service. Okay, so it, it tries to provide a operator load uh, balancer. The actual uh, load balancer is HAProxy under the cover. And uh, HAProxy is, of course, very powerful and uh, used a lot. And what Octavia does is essentially it creates a VM for each load balancer instance, installs an HAProxy image there, configures that HAProxy, and uses that for the load balancing. Okay. Uh, this is all very pluggable, so Octavia calls that VM an M4. It doesn't have to be VM, it could be a container, it could be something else, it doesn't have to be HAProxy. The current reference implementation is a VM with HAProxy running on it. And uh, also, since Mitaka, we have active standby, so Octavia actually creates two VMs for each load balancer instance. One is the active load balancer, and one is the standby that takes over using VRP uh, when the f uh, first one fails. Now, it's important to note that although this picture I showed like the Octavia connected to all of these M4, but actually the uh, data path is separate, it's completely separate for each of them. The only thing that's common is the management network, so the black network on top is just a managed network. Uh, all the data path actually goes to tenant networks. Uh, it's completely separate. Octavia itself under the cover, of course, there are a lot more components. Lots of pluggability, it's a very clean architecture. Everything is a driver. Uh, you could replace whatever you want with, uh, uh, and we actually did that for this work. Uh, so if you don't like any, any part, just write your own driver and replace it and be happy. Okay, so this M4 can actually do much more than just load, plain old load balancing. We just don't just want to distribute the traffic. Um, actually, HAProxy is really great. It can do a lot of things. It can not only load bands, which we expect it to do, but it can do things like SSL termination, offload that task from the backend service. It can do things like layer seven uh, policies and c content switching. Okay, it could do cookie insertion for, uh, for session affinity and stickiness. It could do compression, it could do all sorts of things. Uh, since Mitaka, we now have, thanks to Steven, uh, L7 content switching. Uh, H, uh, so Octavia is constantly adding uh, support for all sorts of things. There's still things that are not supported, like compression. Uh, and in principle, we don't have just to support what HAProxy does. We could actually put whatever we like there. Uh, so we have a framework that actually spawns a VM and puts something, some image on there. So if you have your image doing more, uh, doing caching, maybe doing uh, more stateful firewall, maybe doing something else, uh, doing some your know, complicated rewrite, re-encoding, whatever, whatever you like. This is, of course, not going to be supported by Octavia right now, but you could write a driver to, the, to do that. And it's nice because you could do all sorts of things that you can offload from your backend servers. Now, of course, the more you do, the more resources you use. Okay, so let, let, let's take a step back and think again why we actually wanted a load balancer. So we said we wanted a load balancer uh, to provide high availability, but now we have a single point of failure in the load balancer itself. So we went on and have active standby, so now we don't have that single point of failure. And the other point was performance, okay? But what if my service is fantastic? I have lots of users coming in, I am adding and adding and adding backend servers. This is great. And then I found out that my load balancer cannot handle all that load because it's just a single VM, maybe it cannot handle all of that stuff. So this is a problem. Now, I have a very uh, cool solution, the active-active topology, which basically means that I'm using elastic load balancing. I'm using a pool of M4 to handle all my, my traffic. So I have a bunch of M4 as a pool handling the load balancer duties. This is very nice. Now, the only component I'm missing is some component that will take my clients and actually distribute them over these M4. Okay, so I need to split that traffic. This is great. But sort of, I think I'm stuck in a recursive loop here and I don't know the stop condition. So I'll stop, I'll come back to this point later, okay? Okay, so from the abstract of this talk, uh, our motivation was to cost effectively provide load balancing as a service for cloud workloads. So basically we have customers that expect to support the elastic workloads on the cloud. So they can 
be very small workloads and they be very large workloads, and they want it at a good price. So what a good price means is that the small guys, they expected to get it for free. And the big guys, they're willing to pay, but they expected to whatever, uh, however huge their workload is, that will still support it, okay? So this means that from a load balancing as a service perspective, we must use as little resources as we can when we have a single load balancer and a very small load balancer, but when we have a big load balancer, we need to be able to add resources and add resources and make this happen, okay? Now, the existing Octavia implementation doesn't address that problem because there's essentially there's one VM doing the work for each load balancer instance. So that could be too small for huge workloads, and for small workloads, that's not cost-effective. We could solve it in different ways. Octavia is working on moving the load balancer, maybe have an implementation on containers, which, which is more cost-effective, uh, but still we need to handle the huge loads. Uh, also, with the active standby mode, we have one VM standing idle, so we are at 50% utilization anyway. Okay, so this is why we introduced the active-active N plus one topology. Uh, this is in the final stages of the blueprint. When I uh, pitched this talk, I was hoping that it's already there. Apparently people are working hard on Mitaka and are slower, so I'm, I'm new to this uh, open source stuff. Uh, I couldn't get it through, but I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, so what we have in, uh, in this is NO4, uh, as all of them active, acting as a pool, so can, they can handle a large workload. And essentially what we do is we split the traffic in two stages. First stage is what we call a distributor. It's a simple stage that splits the traffic to all them four, and then we have a second stage that does the regular load balancing, the advanced modern load balancing between them four and the backend service, all this session affinity, SSL termination, and so on. The plus one, okay, is a standby M4, okay, very similar to the standby in an active standby uh, mode, so this standby is just ready to replace a failed M4. When, a, when M4 fails, the traffic just goes to that standby the failed for get recycled, get restarted again, becomes the new standby for the whole thing. And this obviously has better utilization, and we can extend this to N plus K, although not currently supported by our code. Okay, a few words about the distributor. So you should think of the, about the distributor as not as a load balancer per se, but more like a gateway router. So essentially, uh, it should have the same high availability attributes as a gateway. So really all the load, all the workloads, all the traffic goes through it, but it doesn't do much. Uh, seems like hardware is a good match. Seems like uh, native neutron would be a good match in the future. And it's not so smart, okay? So it really is a multiplexer for IP connection. It just needs to balance something not very accurately. All the hard work is being done by them for it. So it's more like ECMP. It could be ECMP, actually. Uh, the only uh, thing that, that we must keep is the affinity. So we must make sure that TCP flows go to the same M4, uh, just because we want to have SSL termination at the M4, and M4 is the real proxy. It terminates the TCP connection. Um, there's no reason why this distributor cannot be shared. So in terms of cost effectiveness, for the small guys, it could be shared. For the big guys, we can have dedicated distributors. SSL termination is only happening at the M4 level, so there's no real security concern there. But if you are a fanatic, you can have your own distributor. Uh, it is multi-tenant. Again, think of a gateway route. And the, if you have your global load balancing already in place and you use DNS for your global load balancing, you could potentially just use plug that in and use directly this is not uh, what we do right now, but potentially you could just do distribution by DNS. Our implementation of the distributor is uh, an SDN software distributor. Uh, what we do is a really simplified uh, one-arm direct routing uh, topology. So that means that the distributor is co-located on the front-end network together with them for and therefore do not advertise their VIP. 
the, all the traffic goes to the distributor and the distributor does essentially L2 forwarding to the right of four. So it just replaces the Mac of itself with the Mac of down four. And it's also direct server return, meaning that uh, traffic going back, the heavy traffic actually doesn't go through the distributor, goes directly to the, uh, through the gateway to the, uh, to the clients. So this means the distributor is pretty lightweight. It doesn't do a lot. Okay. Um, we implemented the dis distributor as open flow rules. Uh, we wanted to be very gener generic and wanted to just do SDN, pure SDN, so we can plug in either software uh, uh, or hardware. Uh, we're actually now experimenting with hardware-based uh, open flow rules uh, and using hardware uh, to implement these open flow rules. Uh, and essentially, we're using version 1.5 uh, of the groups in uh, OpenFlow to uh, select based on a hash of source IP and optionality port, source port. Uh, the implementation, the reference implementation currently is an OVS VM. Uh, it can be any open flow switch, as I said. It is multi-tenant, and we didn't add high availability yet, but it's, it's essentially using exactly the same code that spawns now on 4. So uh, we are going to add the VRP stuff and the HA to that. Uh, if you are uh, more interested in, in the specific rules, uh, this is how the rules look for the forwarding. Very simple, what you have in yellow is your hashing selection method. Uh, what you have in light blue is the fields we are selecting on. So we're selecting on IP source, and in this case also TCP source port. And when you do a selection in a group, it selects a bucket, and each bucket has different actions. In this case, all of them have similar actions. They just replace, they plug in a specific uh, MAC address into uh, the destination Ethernet, and just push it back into the network. Now let's go to elastic load balancing. This is the next step. We have it implemented, but really is sort of a proof of concept, not, not ready code. Uh, we used uh, an EFOR pool that is managed by heat. You could manage it by any other uh, pool manager. You could use Senlin. You could implement your own. Uh, we are actually working now on re-implementing this using uh, the Octavia way, using a cluster manager driver. So it will be uh, pluggable and you could replace that whatever you like. And essentially the features that we need, we don't need full, uh, you know, all the features of heat. We don't need all the features of Sendin. We need uh, something fairly simple. Uh, and it's also attractive in the sense that you don't want to be dependent on another service. Obviously, if you have a backend pool and you are managing that backend pool by Sendin or by heat anyway, so the service exists there, so you might as well use it. Uh, but, if you, but we are trying to make Octavia self-contained, so we are trying to have at least impl one implementation that is, does not depend on anything else. Uh, also, the implementation itself uses the pluggability of Octavia, so we just modified the compute driver. Instead of using Nova drivers directly to, to create compute nodes, uh, to create the M4 nodes, we actually uh, call Heat to do that for us, and it comes back with, uh, with the nodes. Heat creates the initial population of these on four. Uh, it deletes failed on four and recreates them. It, remo it removes the ads on four, uh, overloading uh, when there's overload, underload, uh, and it does all of that. Uh, we use Celometer just because it was the easiest to plug into, into heat uh, to monitor these on four and tell us when they are uh, overloaded and tell us when we actually need to add and remove stuff. All the Load balancing work is still, uh, and all the control of the load balancing as a service is still by, uh, done by the Octavia control. So that means Octavia still, whenever heat spawns in EOM4, Octavia still goes on and configures that HA proxy, does all the w actual work, and Octavia actually still does all the health monitoring that, that it does now. So it knows if EOM4 is alive, it knows the stats, it knows if it's overloaded, and so on. So Octavia knows all of that stuff, so it really there's a question do we need Silometer at all in, in our scenario? But since Octavia is already monitoring all of that stuff, maybe it can just fire uh, these alarms, webhooks directly. Uh, and of course, if we have an internal implementation of Cluster Manager, we don't need uh, to go through Silometer. It, it doesn't make sense. So the existing health monitor does not have you know, out of scale actions, uh, but it's easily added because the monitoring is already there. Uh, finally, we added 
uh, code to make sure that when you add or remove an M4, uh, we are going to add and remove forwarding rules to the distributor, so uh, the distributor has to use this new M4. Uh, it's not like VRP, where you just take over you know, a single IP. Uh, you have to tell the distributor, and it, it, ne it needs to add it to, add it to, uh, to the group. Now, the tricky part there is handling uh, the affinity. So uh, I'm not going to go into details on this, maybe at the end if we'll have enough time, but when there's a big difference between the N plus one and the auto scale. So the N plus one, there's no problem of affinity. If we use hash, the plus one just takes over an existing one. There's no problem of reshuffling. If you auto scale and you increase and decrease your cluster, you have a problem. Uh, both when you go down and you're going to go up. You can do things like consistent hashing to make that better, but you still need to, to handle this. And the way we handle it right now is just do connection tracking to make sure that existing connection, existing TCP connections don't break when you do auto scale up and auto scale down. And with that, I'll hand over to Alan. Hi everyone. So um, maybe let me just talk about a little bit about you know IBM um, Cloud, and so as we as we learned, let's say you know the IBM Cloud you know was actually built on uh, um, open technologies you know just for uh, to ensure you know internal and um, operability and also you know flexibility, and also let's say you know from the session that I learned you know um, uh, at the beginning of uh, you know this week, so IBM actually started to contribute to the you know open source community you know since you know 1998. That was pretty early. You know I didn't know that, and actually let's say those let's say uh, cool you know open technologies are you know kind of becoming the core technology in IBM you know cloud. For example you know containers, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack obviously, and for IBM Cloud, there are a, a bunch of uh, you know cloud offerings are really you know, running you know OpenStack you know operating system, and there are a couple of you know, examples. A couple of years ago, um, we released you know Open OpenStack Services, which is you know a private you know uh, cloud hosting on the software um, data center worldwide, and we have you know container services, we have compute services. Now you know they are running you know I mean OpenStack you know um, environment. And talking about OpenStack, so um, by the way, you know, I'm new to OpenStack, but I think you know I love this community. You know, especially this is my first summit. I love you know I mean uh, all of those sessions here. I think you know I will um, try to you know getting more and more you know plug into this community. And talking about OpenStack itself, um, so basically. IBM, you know, is one of you know, kind of you know, top you know, top you know, contributors, you know, uh, into the community. So that's why you know, I mean, uh, as I learned, you know, I also know probably you, know, you guys have you know, heard you know, uh, from one of uh, you know, IBM sessions that you know, we gotta really kind of a plug you know, into you know, OpenStack you know, deeply and trying to you know, I mean, uh, shape this you know, project you know, well to hope let's say you know, this particular project you know, will be flexible and we can bring in more you know, talents from the community. And this is kind of you know a my personal implement uh, um, understanding about um, a, a cloud. So, a, 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 um, basically, let's say um, as a cloud user, what is really you know essential you know um, kind of a component in the cloud? So I would say this is workload, because you know my you know career started with application. So I wanted to develop application and turn those application as a service, and they'll be happily running in somewhere. Now cloud, you know, is coming to the picture. We're really running the services, you know, in the cloud, and there's a workload. Now there are a couple of aspects, you know, really to um, as an you know, application developer, I wanted to have, you know, some features really um, supported by the cloud. For example, let's say um, high availability. I wanted to have, you know, my my application, you know, it is really as a service. It is never, you know, I mean, it's just say never, but you know, at least have a minimal service outage. So have some, you know, level of uh, availability. That's number one. Second, let's say, you know, when my end user of my application getting increased, and certainly let's say, you know, I mean, the, the data traffic will increase. I wanted to solve the performance issue. So hopefully, let's say, the cloud actually can help us, you know, to, um, you know, solve the performance, to scale up, you know, all those instances to handle, you know, uh, more and more traffic. And what we learned, you know, from Dean, you know, explanation earlier, we need a load balancer, right? Just for you know these two, you know, um, obvious reasons: high availability and performance. And next, let's say you know for um, for load balancer itself, um, we don't want a load balancer to be a single point of failure. 
and that is so obvious. So that's why we need to have you know low balance or HA, and to look at the uh, you know uh, existing Activia um, infrastructure, and we have an active standby. Now, active standby, you know, probably you know is um, is good, is not good enough, you know, to handle more and more, you know, workloads. So we wanted to have, you know, a ability to automate more and more workloads. So we wanted to have a active, active, you know, HA model. And lastly, that you know, with that HA, H, active and active HA model in the in the picture, so we can, you know, possibly just enable, you know, um, per uh, pay per use, you know, those kind of you know feature to be uh, cost effective. So next, let's say, you know, um, let's walk through, you know, the, uh, um, the demo, the work that we have, you know, put together. It is not a, you know, final implementation just for, you know, demonstration purpose. But, you know, the work is very fun. And I will say, you know, uh, Octavia, you know, has a very strong, you know, architecture allowing us, you know, to uh, really, you know, make some, you know, changes, you know, to have that active, active, you know, HA enabled. And I have, you know, a, a web link down there. That's the YouTube, you know, uh, link. You know, if interested, you know, you can go through that, you know, I mean, web click. It is about, let's say, 30 minutes. Um, it's pretty interesting. So before that, let's just walk through, you know, um, um, uh, what kind of, let's say, demo scenario that we have, right? So um, let's pretend that, let's say, we have two, you know, small business wanted to open up, let's say, two e-flower shops. One is, you know, only um, wanted to sell, you know, red flowers. And the other one is, you know, I mean, actually wanted to sell uh, the blue flowers. And each and every, you know, I mean, e-shop, you know, will sell, you know, different kind of red flowers and different kind of, you know, blue flowers. And then we will have each and every kind of flowers hosted in one of uh, the workload or VMs. As you, you know, if you look at the right-hand side, um, if you will, you know, focus on the, uh, the red one, which we will, you know, actually go through a lot of, uh, um, you know, web page, you know, uh, hitting the red flowers, right? And the right-hand side, you know, there are three instances with, you know, different, you know, IP address, um, dot three, dot four, dot five, and those are, you know, kind of a displaying different, you know, flowers, and obviously that will be red. And each and every flowers, uh, flower shop, you know, will actually return the backend, I, uh, backend IP onto the web page. So that we exactly know which you know type of flower and what kind of IP address it is hosting in that you know uh, workload, and we we use let's say you know heat plus salometer you know to auto scale a cluster of uh, um, uh, the M4 VMs or the uh, cluster of uh, you know load balancers, right? If you see, let's say you know focus on the left hand side. Um, basically, the starting point is with only two Infora's because we wanted to have the basic HA that's active, active. We just have two instances, and when the uh, load coming to that you know um, uh, cluster getting increased, and you know, salometer will be filed, and the heat will actually just uh, uh, scale out that particular instance and join that cluster. And on top of that, you know, uh, left hand side, you know, uh, square of uh, the red, you know, Infora, you see a VIP. That's a 20.0.0.12, and that is the virtual IP for um, the cluster of uh, low balancers, right? And the next thing that we customize is that because we wanted to make sure when you access that VIP, you know, we got to make sure which Infora VM we are really hitting. So that's why we kind of, let's say, tweak the you know, um, HA, configura HA proxy configuration a little bit just to inject the Infora ID into it. So when we actually, you know, hitting that, you know, web, um, website, we're getting um, which Infora ID we're hitting back, right? This is only for demo purpose. You know, it just wanted to show that, let's say, we're hitting um, a different um, uh, instance at the back end. That's the workloads. That's the, red, you know, shops over there. And also we're hitting different Infora VMs, okay? So this is the, essentially the web page, you know, I mean, it's a small web page, you know, for, you know, uh, these two, e-flower shops and just for the you know uh, lack of time we just focus on the red you know uh, shop for now right and there are a couple of uh, you know I mean items are you know interesting uh, I wanted to point it out first let's say on the top you know on the address bar you can notice this is the uh, the virtual IP and that's uh, you know 20.0.0.12 that we just saw and the next thing you know we wanted to uh, want you guys you know to focus is on the top of that uh, you know um, uh, image you have, uh, you know, a backend IP, 10.0.0.3. And this is the Infora ID, you know, I was referring to. So when you hit that, you know, uh, cluster Infora, um, 
and this particular info ID will be played back, you know, on the web page. So we know from um, this web page, you know, all those three key informations are visible to us. So next, we refresh, send another, you know, request to that, you know, um, of, uh, virtual IP, and we will see several changes on the web page. So first, obviously, that you know, um, ref log got changed. And you know, we are hitting you know, different uh, um, backend, the different workload. And that workload is running you know, in a different you know, IP address. So previously, that was 10.0.3. Now it is you know, changed to .4, right? At the bottom, um, because we have you know, two NVORAS, so within the cluster, there are two instances running, active, active, again. And the NVORAS ID you know, gets changed. Next, we, um, the one thing you know, is, uh, is not changing, and certainly is the VIP. You know, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Now next, let's say, let's do this again, right? We send another request, so another cus customer probably you know, coming in, right? And then you will see we use the same you know, uh, VIP on the top, and uh, you know, uh, something changed on the, um, on the, on the back end IP, and the flower you know, got changed. And the info ID stay the same, just because the hash you know we use is uh, based on the source IP and port number, and sometimes the the hash you know doesn't actually hit the same you know inf uh, sometimes it'll hit the same you know uh, info ID is not you know I mean guaranteed. So this is kind of let's say you know uh, wanted to just unfold what we created you know using um, Octavia. Uh, we created you know, two uh, different load balancers, one for you know. Um, a, a red e flower shop. The other one is, you know, for you know e blue, and then you have you know different you know um, virtual IPs. And this page, you know, give you kind of a, a admin view of the networking topology. When I say admin, because let's say um, you, you don't see the back you know uh, workloads here, right? You don't see you know all the e flower shops you know anywhere here. That's because those are in tenant you know um, networks. I mean, those are in the tenant views, right? And this admin view got to give us um, some, you know, uh, very interesting information. First, let's go through all the networks that we have, right? And obviously, this is not, you know, um, the latest, you know, Mitaka release because our work, you know, was done actually between Liberty and Mitaka. So during that time, let's say, you know, we were um, just, you know, pick up the latest, let's say, you know, uh, stable Liberty. So that's why this particular screen, you know, may not be uh, refracting the uh, to the latest, you know, Horizon GUI. So first, we have management network, right? On the management, that's the same, you know, management network for uh, Octavia, and the second network is uh, actually for, you know, uh, for Red Shop. That's the uh, uh, the neutral network, you know, for that, you know, Red Shop. And certainly, let's say the color is a little confusing here. It is painted as green, but actually, you know, for our, you know, demo purpose, it is really um, for the Red Shop, right? Now, for now, let's say now let's pretend you know we are um, colorblind, right? So the middle one, you know, is actually not green; it's red, okay? And we have you know, on the on the far right that's uh, the uh, for blue shop, and let's pretend you know uh, we are color you know uh, blind again; that's uh, blue, okay? And this is kind of uh, the magic that we have here for active active. That's the distributor. So the distributor is kind of the one actually will distribute you know the the traffic you know to different you know uh, infra cluster and to solve let's say for red and for blue, and that's why you can see you know the distributor is this you know the special one you know getting to uh, getting plugged in into three different networks management network red shop network and the blue shop network, and the instances on the top that you can see those are the infra you know instances. And uh, for uh, for red shop, you know, you have a cluster. For blue shop, you know, you have a cluster too. Okay. Next, let's say you know, since we are using heat, and certainly we have you know a heat template, you know, to um, keep tracking all the uh, um, infrared cluster. And for heat, if you you uh, you're familiar with that, you know, there are a lot of you know resources, you know, uh, resources under that you know uh, heat template, and there are some. Um, Key stuff I wanted to you know just point it out very quickly. One is you know I mean you have a, a heat auto scanning group, and this is for infrared cluster, and you have two cellometer alarms. One is for scale up, one is for scale down, and correspondingly you have two scaling policies. Now let's just switch it to a different view, and this is kind of you know give you a very nice you know, let's say diagram right, or you can say this is a topology. Now let's switch to a table view. You know, again, this is you know a a heat resource um, list, right? 
essentially, you know, you have uh, that auto scaling group. This is maintaining a cluster of, uh, you know, info array. You have uh, the scale up, you know, alarm, and when the, uh, you know, uh, uh, info, you know, uh, VMs are kind of, you know, getting stressed, you know, this alarm will be filed, and then, you know, the uh, uh, scale up policy will be kicking in, you know, to give you another, you know, info array instance, um, so on and so forth. And then scale down alarm is there. Correspondingly, you have a uh, scale down policy, right? That's all you have, you know, for the uh, um, key template resources. So next, let's say, um, let's take a closer look at, you know, what's in there uh, for, you know, Salometer alarm. So for people, let's say, you know, familiar with all the, uh, you know, Salometer, you know, properties, probably, you know, the right-hand side, you know, is, is the most important thing. So we have alarm, so which is actually, you know, uh, based on, you know, uh, AVG means that's, you know, average, and you uh, kind of uh, have a type of, uh, you know, threshold alarm, and the threshold that we set is 40%. And the period, you know, we wanted to give is, you know, 120 seconds, which, enough, uh, which is two minutes. And one thing, you know, forget to highlight is the, uh, the evaluation period. We set to one. And the state means, let's say, salometer basically came bouncing back, you know, with uh, three different, um, you know, states. Unknown is actually, um, uh, you know, you don't have sufficient data, right? Okay, you know, you have sufficient data, but the alarm does not actually meet all the conditions. Then, you know, the last one is alarm, meaning let's say condition is met, you set the alarm. When the alarm is, you know, fired, then the alarm action, that URL, will be invoked. So for the folks actually don't quite get, you know, the uh, salometer alarm yet, that's okay. I give you this particular statement. So this is just alarm fires when the average usage of the CPU consumption greater than 40% over two minutes. That's kind of, you know, a, a, a quick, uh, um, you know, description about this particular alarm. And the same thing, let's say, for scale down um, alarm, we have, you know, a uh, defined as an average, you know, uh, static alarm, uh, and the threshold, you know, is set to 10%, right? So you have, you know, period, you know, it's uh, 120, right? And the statement is that, you know, you have, uh, you know, the alarm fired, you know, uh, when the average of, uh, you know, CPU utilization less than 10% over two minutes. So next, let's say, you know, we really start the stress, you know, we have a utility, and, uh, you know, that utility is just, you know, sending all the, uh, you know, ping um, requests, you know, uh, aggressively. And this is kind of the page that we show here, you know, to track the, uh, you know, the status of uh, the, uh, you know, um, uh, salometer alarm. So you can see that, you know, the CPU ut utilization is getting increased um, over 40% uh, as we, you know, defined in the salometer, you know, uh, property. And once that, you know, salometer uh, gets fired, a new, you know, infra VM will be added to the cluster, and obviously that's by, you know, key engine. So next, let's say, you know, for, um, we take that stress away, you know, let, let it just cool down, you know, then the uh, salometer, you know, will, uh, uh, will track those uh, CPU utilization, you know, getting dropped. It is uh, um, below, you know, 10%, and certainly, you know, uh, within two minutes. Um, and then existing, you know, infra VM will be removed from the cluster, you know, by heat engine as well. I mean, this is kind of, you know, very straightforward. Now, this particular chart is very interesting that, you know, we really, you know, capture this, you know, chart, you know, we run the test, you know, for a couple of hours, um, and, you know, we see where th this is really uh, working. And essentially, let's say, this chart, you know, proves us, you know, it is working. And you can see on the line, I mean, on the line, um, that particular line is uh, just explaining, let's say, you sending the load, you know, uh, aggressively increase the load and uh, decrease the load. And the, uh, the green one, you know, is actually um, a track of how many, you know, inferior, um, VMs that you have. And initially, you know, uh, starting from two, we wanted to have active, active, you know, just two uh, instances as the minimal. Then when the load, you know, increase, you will see all the infer infer number of, you know, inferior VMs getting increased as well. And the uh, load gets down and all the inferior, you know, VMs, you know, cool down and they essentially got destroyed by key engine. And this is another, you know, I mean, uh, interesting chart we wanted to see uh, with that, you know, a particular approach. And, you know, pretty much the balancing is at 
um, um, two levels. You know, at the back end, you know, since we're using um, the uh, uh, round robin, you know, um, algorithm, you know, for the load balancer, you know, uh, the first, let's say, um, uh, script, you know, it is actually just capturing, you know, when you hit that, you know, back in um, server, right? So the load is equally, you know, uh, distributed, and the second script is actually just to capture um, um, how how often, you know, we're hitting, you know, each channel, you know, uh, in front of VM. It turns out, you know, it's uh, almost, let's say, equally given, right? That is pretty much, you know, concludes, you know, the uh, the demo. And you know, if you're interested, go to that, you know, uh, YouTube link, and it should be um, very interesting. All right. Now I hand it over back to Dean. I think we ran out of time. Uh, very few seconds. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go into containers, um, unfortunately. So uh, I just wanted to, to uh, just mention in one sentence that. There is work being done on Octavia to move to containers, and uh, this helps and in terms of cost efficiency, and the active active actually allows you to use containers because we can, the default configuration could be a lot of containers, and so it gives you better spread and better availability, and uh, maybe even saves you some of the stuff in terms of the availability just because containers are faster. Um, this is really the end. Uh, so I'm open for questions. Uh, if you do have any remarks, you don't like this design, this is your last chance to go over to these blueprints. Don't do it. But uh, uh, so that's really your last chance. And I really hope we, we get this thing done. Yes, please. So my question is practically, uh, you, you told that these load balancers are practically VMs. So these are glance images, right? So what, what I prefer, and those are instantiated from like, like an OI instance, is it? Yes, r r right now, uh, uh, so Octavia Code distribution actually actually uh, creates those images for you. Okay, goes on and fetches and creates and builds the, the images for you uh, for the basic implementation. But essentially, you could do whatever you like. You could put whatever you like there. Um, uh, we are thinking that uh, uh, th there's some thought of maybe being able to specify flavors so you can m maybe define through flavors different topologies and, and different uh, types of for. Okay, so, so the kind of agents that you have, what, what has to be running inside of the VM that is configuring the AJ proxy of, or, the, or the correct load balancer is, is just provided by you when you are provisioning that kind no, of virtual so, machine. So there's a separate component. There's a separate component of uh, Octavia, okay? So Octavia has a controller, spawns these uh, VMs per load balancer. The load balancer itself, what Octavia now spawns, it spawns a generic thing. And it happens to be an image of HA proxy, And it goes on and configures it. But if you replace that driver, you can do something else if you want to. But if, if you just download uh, Octavia, it will do all the things for you. So it has all the scripts. So it, it's not packaging HE proxy inside, as I believe, but it's actually creating, the, fetching that image and creating it for you. So if you just take the code, uh, you will get all, all the things you need to, to have a, an implementation running. Okay. So I had a question I saw on the slides. You said there's demo code. Is this being developed with the OpenStack? community process? Is it available in Garrett today? Uh, you should know the answer for that. So, uh, so actually, uh, as I said, I, I'm new to this, and I was trying to push code, and then I pushed a little bit of code, and people said, no, no, go away. You didn't put a blueprint yet, so you can't push any code. So I have all this code waiting, and I said, oh, blueprint, no problem. People will just say yes, and you know, they have no objections, and they just say yes, and it didn't happen. So. This code is purely developed for OpenStack. Uh, it, it, it was developed for OpenStack before we knew actually what we'll do it was in IBM. Uh, and probably we'll not consume it by IBM if it doesn't go to OpenStack. So we're totally focused on that. So I'm research, I don't care, but he's dev. And he actually uh, has a team and, and they're working on actually coding stuff and, and you know, having light items and, and so on. I'm happy just uh, coming with the design and say, oh, it's possible, and I go away. But no, I'm not going away. I'm, uh, we actually committed to, to this code, so this was just a joke. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just to clarify for myself, uh, as of today's Mitaka, uh, Octavia, uh, uh, does it uh, support SSL termination, right? It does. 
Yeah, and where uh, where does it store the certificates? In Barbican. In Barbican. So that is supported already. Yeah, yeah. This this is already supported. I think actually supported from Liberty. Uh, oh. I'm not sure it completely worked out, but yeah, it it's, it it works from Liberty. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when you scale down, does it drain connections off the load balancer before terminating the VM? So yeah, th this is this is a valid point. Uh, we don't have that code in yet. Uh, we actually don't have any code to drain connections, even when you just you know do an upgrade to M4 and things like that. Uh, so yeah, that that's a missing piece that we need to add. Thanks. Any more questions? No. Thank you for staying late.